Welcome to um, Wednesday evening here in Anchorage, Alaska. We are live. We are excited to be here. We're going to be teaching um, the Biblical Foundations of Freedom. And we welcome you. And we're very happy that you're here, people that are online and the audience. Everybody who's here, I just want to thank you for coming. Lord, um, you are just a blessing to me that you are here, and I thank you so much. So I'm going to open this up in um, prayer, and then we're going to get started. Father God, we love you, and <clears throat> we want to um, take a breath in, breathe you in, and breathe you out. Father, we love you. Father, we ask that you would come. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here tonight in this teaching. And we are thankful that we live in a free country where we can gather together, where we can learn about you and your ways. Father, where we can um, encourage one another. So God, I thank you. And Lord, I pray that you would bless every person who's online listening. I pray that you bless them in Yeshua's mighty name. And I ask that you would that your words would go deep within them. Father, that you would grow what you want them to know. Father, that you can speak to all of us individually. And Lord, I, that's just so exciting to me that we can all be listening and you speak differently to each one of us. God, thank you. We set this time aside for you and your son, Jesus, and we bind the enemy in any way where there's distraction or confusion and we speak your truth and your love in this room. Father God, I pray that you would sharpen our discerner, that you would open up the eyes of our heart. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Okay. Well, as I said, my name is Cindy. I am a teacher here at Wellspring, and I have been here, um, I guess, almost going with nine years, nine or ten years now. So I've been here for a while, and I've been teaching for about seven years. And... I came through these doors um, after going through, I'll just tell you a little bit about my story, after going through many issues in my life, like all of us go through. We all go through stuff in our life. We all go through different things. Some things were good and some things were not so good. And I knew at a really young age that I um, wanted my life to be different. And so I started to search out to try to um, find how I could fix myself and I went through so many counselors I was very well known for interviewing counselors and going to them and self-help groups I took my recovery and my health and who I was very serious so interviewing counselors was not something that was beside me to do that and so I remember when I chose to come here and I never will forget that moment when I came. And that moment had to do when I was in a lot of pain. And a lot of, and for me and for many people, it's the pain many times we, it can drive, it drove me for help. And so I went out and I interviewed some counselors and I was given the very same diagnosis that I had been given, which was PTSD, that there had been a lot of trauma in my life. And I was going to start some sort of a therapy with a counselor. And I had known somebody in my life who had been radically changed through the biblical foundations of freedom, which I had done Christian counseling before, so it wasn't something that was new to me. But I decided there was that intersection. It's kind of the road that we all go down and where we make our decisions. right? And then we're going to be talking about that tomorrow. We're going to be talking about discernment and making decisions. And I have to tell you that I am so thankful that I chose to come in through these doors. And I called my friend and she started one-on-one -on -one counseling and I was crying and she was, I was crying and she was excited. <laughs> I was like, I didn't understand why she was excited because I, I was in a lot of pain. And she said, I think, I, you know, it's in the pain that, I, that God is going to help you. And so I came in here, um, one of my... Um, I, part of my life story is coming out of addiction and my adult children being in it, some of my adult children being in addiction and that's what was happening. And so I, that's what I came in here for was because I was having a really hard time with that situation. 
And so I started to practice the biblical foundations of freedom in the situation in my relationship. And so it was the relationship that drove me. And so I started, I started counseling. And when, and when I applied what I learned, when I started to learn about my discerner, and I started to learn about what sin was, and I started to learn about my thoughts and what all of that meant, I started to see these amazing, I just saw God show up in such a powerful way in my relationship and in an and answers to prayer and peace, a peace that I had never experienced that I was able to keep. And so that was like what, what, what drove me here. And after four months of being here, I got a diagnosis of cancer. And that was when I really started to, where I really understood that we have an adversary and his name is the devil, his name is Satan, and he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And I used these principles here and to stand and to um, have tenacity to hang on to my God for my healing, to hang on to my God for uh, what, that he was going to do something good. No matter what it meant to me in my life, that it was going to be good. And he used it in a very powerful way. Uh, during the time that I was going through chemo, after my chemo, um, with my families. So that's just a little bit of my story. And so today I can stand and say that cancer does not belong in my body, that I am, I am healed, that God is a miracle working God, that he, the same thing he does for me, he wants to do for others. It's not like I was his favorite and because you know why? Because we're all his favorites. We're all his favorites. And there's enough in the kingdom. That's another that's something I learned here is that that when he gave when he healed my broken heart and when he gave me back my relationships, he he wants to do that for other people. And that there's always enough. It's not like it runs out. There's always enough. And so anyway, so that's just part of my story. And um, that's what drove me in here to, uh, into here. So um, I'm going to just talk about that book right here. That's, this is what I came into doing Bible studies. Doing uh, I did this uh, two week school of ministry. I came into the classes. It, this is truly I found freedom is exactly what I found was freedom, and I live in that lifestyle. And that's what I call it now is I live in that lifestyle where. I want to walk with freedom and peace and joy and righteousness every day. And that I can, and that God is never, He's not the God who tells us that He wants us to do things and doesn't equip us. That He's given all of us, every, all the keys that we need to be able to uh, unlock and to use His principles to be able to have freedom in our life. And so, uh, another, what, another thing that you might be interested in, if you're interested in that, you could, we'll send you one if you are online, we will send you one, is the study guide. And so this is a study guide that you can do while you're reading. I want to tell you that anybody can be a group leader to run a, a Bible study group that has to do with the biblical foundations of freedom. So this is a way that it can equip you. God wants to use all of us for his kingdom purposes. And he wants to equip us, regardless of, no matter what, he wants to equip us. He wants to equip you. There's also a syllabus. I'm going to be, um, you can take notes in if you're interested in this. And um, But I'll be doing PowerPoint tonight, so that we'll be following along on that syllabus. And this is actually the two-week school of ministry, which I think we're going to be, we have a goal of having that in November. And so we're hoping that that, go, that, that moves along and that we're able to do that. And we're praying for that. So if you are interested in the two-week school in ministry where you learn a lot of scientific information about our bodies and how our brain works and how they're connected and how spiritually we're all, it's all together and then you spend time learning how to pray with somebody, letting somebody pray with you so that you are equipped to go out and to minister and help somebody, to encourage somebody. And one of the things that I did is I... Um, would all, I keep these little bookmarks that came, and uh, this is this is a Wellspring bookmark, and this bookmark I took it with me wherever I went. I had them in my house, and I would always like to have a couple extra in my car. I think there will have to admit that there was one time when I was not prepared, 
but to try to, you know, to be able to talk to somebody about, hey, I, you know, I went through this, I can talk to you about that. Let me talk to you about what forgiveness will do for your heart. Let me talk to you about what, it will, what kind of freedom it will bring you when you forgive. And so on the back, there's two prayers. So the lifestyle that we teach here is forgiveness, where you forgive others, you forgive yourself, um, and repent, and you ask God to forgive you. And so the first uh, part is the forgiveness prayer, and then the second part is the repentance prayer. And so um, if you would like one of these, we're going to pass this around. And Alice, I'm going to start with you. So as you are listening tonight, if God has something on your heart, please write it down and share it with somebody at the end. Um, we encourage, I encourage you to pray with one another, to listen to what God's saying to you. If you have any questions, um, that, it, that it's good to ask questions. Right? I've been talking to God a lot about asking him um, what does he want me to be doing. And, um, and he, the, one of the things that he told me was, I want you to start paying, I want you to pay attention. Mm. Those are his two words. Pay attention. Okay? That's what he wanted me, wants me to do. And I'm going to be talking about paying attention tonight. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that came from the Biblical Foundations of Freedom was a, chi a children's book on choose of choice and the Biblical Foundations of Freedom. So I had the honor of sitting on a team and creating the curriculum and teaching it to our children. So if this is something you're interested in and you are leading a group of children, um, you can equip them um, to walk with for, in forgiveness and repentance because I truly believe that God is raising up a generation that will be taking um, as a, his warriors that walk with that um, bitterness and walk in a lifestyle of repentance and forgiveness and that that's how he can use us because that's that's our vessel of honor okay well one of the things we'd like to do is last uh, talk about testimony because we are uh, saved by the word of our testimony the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony and last week Kathy taught on what is what is sin and so we just I this is what I grasped so wonderfully here was that it's very simplistic. There's two natures. There's God natures and the enemy's nature. And there's no gray. And so and that God, and that neither nature can ever change. And I realized that when I um, which I could easily understand that the enemy would never feel sorry for me and decide one day he wanted to love me. That was super easy for me to believe that. But when it came to believing that my God always loved me, that's where I wavered. But coming here, I chose to say, if the enemy's nature doesn't change, neither does God's nature. And that brought back a new type of life for me. That God, my God, he never changes. His nature never changes. And so... Last week, Kelly taught on what is sin. So I want to ask anybody, if anybody has a testimony of this week, when you were walking around and living your life and having conversations and being in encounters with people, if you recognize God's nature and or the enemy's nature. If, that, you know, if that's something that, that happened with you, I'd, we'd love to hear your testimony. Or any other way that the Biblical Foundations of Freedom is... Uh, mauling over and there's things going on in your heart that's, that's changing you that you're excited about. Esther. I definitely <laughs> seem to have forgotten what sin was. <laughs> 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 because uh, through this COVID thing, um, I was getting bitter against people that were um, like fearful and accusing me of not wearing masks and stuff and being angry at me. Mm -hmm. But instead of me just loving them and forgiving them, I was like um, angry and just like denying that, that I was angry and mm -hmm. just it was like a blanket thing that I wasn't going to accept what was going on. So once I recognized that I was sinning with the way I was treating, you know, ignoring and being rude to, like, 
not giving her eye contact and that kind of thing because she had turned me in a couple times for not wearing my mask. <laughs> um, then I, I realized I was spinning. No matter how she treated me, that was still spinning. Mm -hmm. That's a good word. It's a good word. And, um, you know, um, it's exciting to me to see what's transpiring out of the COVID situation because our God is good and he is showing us and he's squee there's a squeeze going on right and we get to find out what's going on in our heart and it's a new level that god is taking us through and how are we responding you know and i love what esther just said that when is sin or un as an example when is unforgiveness considered to be a sin you know, at what level is it? Because in God's kingdom, sin is sin. And um, when we become angry or bitter, um, it's a sin. It doesn't matter at what level it is. So thank you, Miss Esther. Does anybody else want to share? Okay, well, tonight we're going to be looking at discernment, which is chapter 2. And I'm super excited about it. Um, I'm going to read this to you, Proverbs 3.21. This is for each one of you. And you can just put your name right in there. So you could say, um, My mark, never drift off course from these two goals for your life. Walk in wisdom and, and to discover discernment. Don't ever forget how they will empower you. I love this because as I looked at the verses that followed in from 22 through 24, I like that when when we read and we study the word it's one of god's it's like his love language is obedience and studying his word is the order he puts things and the first one is is that walk in wisdom the scripture doesn't say discover discernment and walk in wisdom the scripture says walk in wisdom which tells me i need to know what walking in wisdom means for me before i discover discernment that as i walk in that wisdom then he will show me discernment and walking has to do with action and how important that is. Some of the promises in the following verses happens when we walk in wisdom. It strengthens us from the inside out. It inspires us to do what's right. It energizes and refreshes us by the healing it brings. It gives me living hope to guide me so not one of life's tests or troubles will cause me to stumble. It helps me to sleep like a baby, safe and sound, and that my rest will be sweet and secure. And it keeps my heart at rest in every situation. And I love that because that's his promises. God's word, his word, it are promises for us to be able to live by. And so what I like is that if my heart becomes uh, restful, or my heart, my thoughts, my heart are my thoughts and my feelings and my choices. And like what Esther talked about, when you get that unrest, it's like, oh, hallelujah. Guess I'm awake. <laughs> I'm paying attention, God. Help me. And that he wants to bring us back in to his peace. He's always waiting for us. And he wants to guide. He wants to show us. So the definition of discernment is the ability to see clearly to perceive, distinguish, recognize. And God's definition is, um, out of Hebrews, it says strong meat belong to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read on to Hebrews 6. It says, therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. See, that's what God wants. I was an elementary teacher. Um, I was not a college professor, right? Well, when we say yes to Jesus and we say yes to him being king of our heart, he wants us to grow up. And it has nothing to do with our physical age. It has everything to do with our spiritual age. And he wants us to go on to maturity. He does not want us to... Um, it's, it talks about the... Um, elementary foundation of repentance of dead works and faith towards God and talking about or understanding the instruction about washing and laying on of hands Paul is saying let's move past this 
Let's move past that and let's move into maturity. So teaching his word and applying his word in our everyday life um, is super important, right? Um, and that he puts that in our heart. He has designed what he wants us to do in maturity. There's so many things that God wants us to do. He wants his believers to be inventors and discoverers. Um, he wants us to be um, heads of corporation. He wants us in the political world. He wants us to be maturing and taking his kingdom into our world. Well, two of the ways that I saw that done, which I read about a little bit, one that I've been involved in, is a dream that was put into two different women's hearts here in Anchorage. And one of them, um, from that dream, she hung on to that dream, and God used her, and she opened up the Hope Center, which is a homeless shelter for women. Right? Because God wants to do that type of work, where uh, Yeshua, Jesus, is preached, where homeless women um, hearts are healed, where there's prayer, where there's education, where there's funding that a woman, that God put that on a woman's heart, and she said yes to it. She didn't bury it in her heart. She said yes to it. Another one is um, we have a woman that's no longer around, but her name is Mother Lawrence. And she was a woman who wanted to feed, the, feed people who were hungry. And she started out of her home. She lived where she lived. And that, there it is a Mother Lawrence Foundation where children and adults are fed. And it was put on her heart. See, God puts on our heart a dream. And if he puts it on our heart, we can fulfill it with him. And he wants us to do that. So, so that's that. Dis, that's that discernment. That he wants us to be exercising to go on to maturity. And how we do that is through our senses. So that word "perceive" means using all of our senses to be able to discern what he wants and to exercise. Right? If um, I love the example of my husband, who is a retired police officer, um, he was trained to spot. Um, illegal behavior and so we went into a store and I was shopping and he was I was shopping for clothes and he was finding illegal behavior <laughs> and um, I was trained in shopping for clothes <laughs> and he was trained in shopping for illegal behavior not only did he find illegal behavior he called ahead because he knew where they were going to be going and the other store was waiting for them and when they came in they arrested him because he knew, because of the training that he had been through. And so, um, that's what God wants. He wants us to be trained and discerning and recognizing. So Dave's senses have been trained in that, and God wants us to train our senses. In 2 Timothy, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. See, we're all in training, OJT, on-the-job training, right? So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So um, as I was getting ready to teach, of course, you know, the, the COVID situation is going on, and I think all of us are questioning and wanting to discern what's going on. Right? And getting answers for it. But this is what I've learned. God isn't answering the COVID questions. He's, he's answering questions like, get your heart healed. Get prepared. Pay attention. Be ready for my voice. Right? He wants us to be ready so that when he wants to, us to move, that we're ready. That we're like, we can hear that voice like it says in John 10. That my sheep hear my voice and they follow me and they never follow a stranger's voice. He wants us to be able to recognize that voice. Um, I ran a marathon, right? I, I could walk about, I could talk about wanting to run a marathon, I could read about re re running a marathon, but I had to train to run a marathon. Mm -hmm. My husband could read about being a police officer and he could talk about wanting to be one, but he had to go into training to do that. And so that's what God wants with us with our discerner. He wants us to go into training. He wants us to read about it. He wants us to talk about it. But he wants us to practice it. He wants us to practice 
and, and our, our discernment. I love this because I found this from one of my friends. She gave it to me. And it, the first two words say, pay attention. Right? Our Father God wants us to pay attention. Why? In order to gain and to know intelligent discernment of spiritual matters. And I think it's important for you to ask, what do you believe? Because that's what discernment is about. Mm -hmm. And that, do you believe there's a spiritual world? Because I do. And I didn't want to believe that when I first came here. I didn't want to believe, you know, I had grown up... I grew up in a, in a faith where there was all kinds of demonic stuff. I was involved in, all, in many, many types of aspects in that. And I just kind of wanted to wash my hands of it. And I was kind of tired of it. I didn't want to try to, it just, I didn't like it. And it created a lot of pain for me and I didn't like it. So I now know that there is a spiritual world. And I had to come to an under, I had to choose it. I had to say, I believe. I believe your absolute truth. And it says in the word that word that there is a spiritual world. Mm -hmm. And so as we're using our discerner, which comes from Holy Spirit, so it's super important that um, people around you are discerning, just like you're discerning. You are all making reason of it, but we but when you have Holy Spirit, that's who reveals to you. The spiritual matters. When you don't have Holy Spirit to guide you, you are functioning with your knowledge, with the intellectual knowledge in the world, and you're not you're not operating in a spiritual intellect. And that there is a spiritual component to everything that's going on around us, mm -hmm. and for us to be aware that there's a spiritual component going around. Cindy, when you're I'm listening to you, I'm thinking of the verse um, that says, "God, look, uh, we look at the outside, but God looks at the inside." Yeah, the inside. Yeah, to imitate our God, so we're to be looking at the inside. inside. Yeah, at the inside. Yeah, that's right. yeah and he that's he lives in us. Holy Spirit mm -hmm. lives in us, right? He's the one who gives us that knowledge. And so I love this. Just do it. The Nike slogan because it's about practicing. And applying for if you, if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Just like Dave's training for his position, um, God wants us to train for kingdom positions. Right? When we respond his way, it does become our normal, which is life transformed for his kingdom. So just do it. It's about listening and obeying. It's about listening and obeying. Um, you can hear the Word of God, but if you don't practice the principles in it, you will forget it and you will struggle. And so one of the things that, as being an educator, because I was an elementary teacher, that was I love children, is that there's different types of learning and how much we really take in. So if you're just um, listening to me, you're not going to be able to pull in a lot of information. But if you're writing about it, it compounds. It compounds. And it even blows up if you teach it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he's talking about. He's talking about to being a doer of the, of the word, not just a hearer of the word, but to be a doer of the word. And that discernment, you know, God has given us all discernment, but um, we, we get to choose how strong we want our discerner to be. When we knew, like what Esther said, to give a, tune our discerner, to tune it up, right? And that we don't get a certificate and we graduate and we never have to tune our discerner up. <laughs> discernment is so important in every single conversation because life is is in our words, life or death, and that there are spiritual, there is a spiritual world in our life, our words bring life, or our words can bring death. So discerning is being in the, so discerning looks like being in the middle of a conversation and, in, and slowing down in the middle of a heated conversation or a conversation that you don't want to be in and 
being inspired to do what's right and being inspired to do what's right. It looks to me like this, that when I'm interceding, that for someone I love, that I'm interceding for them and I'm speaking life instead of talking about them or the situation to someone else or going into fear or grumbling and complaining because I don't like the way that they're talking to me. Like I want them to be a certain way. But that my God wants me to, um, to bring his kingdom and I do that through tuning my discerner, take, listening to what my thoughts are and, and then speaking his thoughts, not my thoughts, about that person or that situation. You mean out loud or in your mind? Well, if I'm in the conversation with somebody, if I'm in the situation, never out loud. <laughs> never, and, unless I feel like God is wanting me to speak encouragement to them or to pray with them, then um, that's, that's what I would do. So what you're saying then is, is when you're in a conversation with somebody, and in your mind you're having critical thoughts about them, mm -hmm. you're saying like right then and there you just change those thoughts. Yes, and that God has given us the power to be able to change our thoughts. That's what, yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Yes, and we have the power to do that. And it makes us, and, okay, anyway, so, uh, so who blinds our eyes? Now the second Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says, And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believeth not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So who is the God of the world? He's, he is the enemy. He's the adversary. He's called um, the ruler of this world, the prince of the air. And he's after your spiritual eyes. That's what he wants. He wants your eyes to be closed. He wants your ears not to hear. He wants your reasoning. He does not want you to be able to understand or receive God's truth. And that's only done through discernment. And this is why. Because he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. So when you think about people, even in situations in your life, maybe something that happened yesterday or something that happened today, and you're not even sure why somebody would behave the way that they behave. But when you, if, I just want to tell you why. Because as we make choices, when we look at a situation and we talk about a situation, we are making choices in every one of our conversations. And we are reacting to them. And every time that we react that's not God's way, it changes our perception. And it changes our belief system. Every time that we operate in a way that's not from God. And that is talked about in John 12, 4, that the enemy has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. So that's what that hardening of the heart is. Is it where we cannot hear God? We cannot hear His voice. So that their spiritual eyes cannot see and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and have me heal them. And that's really super powerful. This Can I is. Ask a question? Mm -hmm. So when you say hardening of your heart, does that have anything to do with just the things you've been through in your life? That hardens your heart? That can harden your heart. Okay. I'm just yeah, that can thinking out loud that you've been through a traumatic life and mm -hmm. don't believe, say, and your heart is hardened. Right. What could it be if you don't reach out or ask? Or just yeah, I think there's there's many ways that your, your heart can be hardened from... Um, um, academic, a lot of it, having a lot of intelligence, and not having, not knowing what that, what faith is, right. you know, and not having that belief. Hard. Go ahead. Yeah, I, um, a thought of how my heart got hardened is, it's like, it's kind of like if you get mad at somebody, and at first it kind of almost feels good. Oh right. You know, it's like, you know, it, but it's kind of like holding a water bottle out. You know, at first it's like, oh, I can hold this. This is not, no, no problem. But then pretty soon it starts hurting, and it's hard, it's heavy, and it's hard to hold. And it's like if you, if I held that bitterness in my heart too long, then I started replaying, and then pretty soon I, you know, my 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 bitterness went from just a little bit mad to full out hate. <laughs> that was my heart heart, you know. And so it came. That was how the heart got hardened for me. Well, for me, um. Grief has hardened my mm -hmm. heart. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to you thinking, okay, that's a possibility then. Like 
for me, like I said, grief over the past eight years for me has really hardened right. my spirit, right. my heart, and it's taken, it's taking, it will take a little bit to work, you know, I'm obviously we're all works in progress, but this will not come overnight. It um, doesn't come overnight, but I will tell you that, uh, to, as an example, Christy, today I, I sat in the presence of God for 45 minutes mm -hmm. over one issue, right. over one issue. And that I would talk to God about it. And I asked him questions. Show me what's in my heart. Mm -hmm. Show me where um, my heart is broken in grief. And I, I really, so that he can bring it to you and show it to you so that he can heal it. Well, like I was telling you when I first came here, yeah, I didn't want to come, right? I'm in a lot of physical pain. Right, and it right. really going to help me. But right. bitterness, right? Right. Self-bitterness. Nope. <laughs> over here, we, we switched over and we said our little, you know, right. our prayer. That, like I told you, I have no idea what I said, but it was like, do you? All right, and here I am. Good. But Good. that's not. Esther will attest to the fact that I'm very driven. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do know exactly yeah, what you mean. It's just one of those. Yeah. And trying to change the change my view. And I just love that because you know what, the just even wanting that or yeah. talking about, you know, that my the way I'm looking at things mm -hmm. is not the way I want to be looking at them. The way I want to perceive things, that's not that's not I know that's not who God is. Right. And what we're right. bring to this right. my next um, my sister went through uh, really rehab in Asheville, North Carolina and was body, mind and spirit. Yeah. And that was just the way she's an alcoholic and mm -hmm. going through recovery. Mm -hmm. And she tried all the regular for lack of a better word, and then she went to this um, rehab in Asheville, North Carolina, and they approached it a whole different way. It's, yeah, they, and she's thriving as a result of spiritual, not you will. Right. You know what I mean? Like pulling from you know the deep, deep down, and knowing what you, what you, what you want to experience, what right. you're going to get out of it, what you put into it, mm -hmm. and looking at yourself in that way. What do you bring to the conversation? Right. And what do you bring to that? And you're you're becoming more aware. Yes. Of discerning. And all that's that discerning. You're, that's the you're discerning. Right. That's the and then I'm going to add the word says that the word is fast. It is fast. So you might want to change it. It's going to take a long time. <laughs> because yes. what we've got here is, you know, secular counseling will take a long time and it won't get you anywhere. But when you're doing the word of God, the word is fast and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, and it cuts right to where the, the marrow and the mm -hmm. and the, uh, the, the the spirit and the body. Thank you. That uh, that like that tightened it up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, just like I said, thinking in grief and that has hardened my heart to a degree. But with her help and, and other people, I'm able to twist that right. and say, Oh, okay, maybe it wasn't about me after all. Right. And be able to, and I was just telling Esther when you said just do it, my husband who passed away in January would add the F word in between that just, <laughs> just because he gave it more of a punch. Right. You know, and he said, right. pay attention. There's things out there that you miss if you don't pay attention. There's details oh, that's everything. Right. Okay. And a word, you switch a word or whatever word you use in a sentence and change the, the whole words. meaning. The whole meaning. And he was yeah. always saying that to me about pay attention to what, you know, what you're alluding you know, what you're doing as far as your yourself. Right. I just, I want to add to what Christy's talking about, and that is like wanting the, the heal, like what her family member went through, that the healing of, the, because God wants to heal our soul, he wants to heal our body, and he wants to heal our mind. And that's called sozo. It's a complete healing. And she is. It is, it is a complete healing. And that, yeah. that is important. And I want, what I want to share is that, we do have a clipboard up here if you're interested in doing one-on-one -on -one counseling. When I came, because I had done group therapy and I had done counseling, I had went to 12-step programs, but when I came here, it was 75% praying. And so the prayer ministry here is what I absolutely believe in, is, is that we equip people in being able to hear God's voice. And that we navigate through prayer healing. But that Holy Spirit is in charge of the session. It's not the counselor, it's Holy Spirit. And then the person, as they hear God's voice, that's our next prayer. And so um, it's a 75 minute session, and it is, I would highly recommend it. it 
Um, I've been graduated. I graduated quickly. I was not here as long as in my other types of counseling, and um, it gave me the power. It equipped me to know how to handle situations in my life, no matter what the situations were, whether it's grief or disappointment or fear that I can handle all of them through trauma. If there's a trauma that God, that through this counseling, God has helped me to know how to handle um, traumatic um, situations. Okay? All right, so he, the enemy, is the one who blinds and hardens our hearts and our eyes. And it says in Luke 8, 12, that the adversary will, can, will come and try to take the, the word right out of your heart. So he it wants to try to pull it right away from you. Right, and that how important it is that we stay connected to God all the time. Right. The enemy, like what Janice talked about, wants us to stay stuck in being offended or jealous in unforgiveness because that keeps us from maturing. Right? He wants us to be, he wants us to grow up, he wants us to be a vessel of honor so that he can we can be used for his purposes. So you know what I noticed that that scripture that says that the word is sharp, sharper than any two-way sword, dividing my ways. From his, from his way. That's what it is mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. It's, it's Good. Like, that's what it's divided for me. Is, oh, that's not his way. That's not my way. Okay. <laughs> I'm changing. You know, I want to do it your way. You know, his ways are with me. His, his ways are what heals. His ways are what heals. So we can go to our God anytime and ask him. We can say, so right now I pray that you would strengthen every person's discernment that you would sharpen their discernment to be able to hear you. We can go and talk to them. David wrote this in Psalm. Examine me and probe my thoughts. Test me and know my concerns. See if there's any um, other versions say wicked. Uh, wicked ways. This version says idolatrous, which is the same as pain or sorrow or offense. Any kind of a tendency or habit or a pattern that I notice in myself that I continue to go back to. And lead me in the ancient reliable path that his path and his ways are the same yesterday his ways are the same today and his way and his ways are the same tomorrow okay so David I was reading up about David and I love this because it talks a little bit about this psalm right here it's in the most this is what I read in the most literal meaning um, he David was asking him to put him to the test like a metal as it's used here, David is asking God to try him and to refine him. To do what must be done to ensure he is pure. And that the basic basis of metals needs refinement. And even the most precious metals are made more valuable through the fire. Faith like gold is more precious when tried by fire. Further, the request of the psalmist is that he would know um, his ways and that he would... Um, refine him and that is going through fire so we're going to i'm going to lead you through a prayer and we're going to ask god to open the eyes of your heart okay so just repeat after me father god father god i give you permission to search me i give you permission, you permission to search me and try me for any wicked or anxious way try, try me for any wicked or anxious way i ask that you reveal any pain I ask you to reveal any sorrow or offense pattern in me. sorrow or offense pattern in me. And lead me in the reliable ancient path. And lead me in the reliable ancient path. Father God. Father God. I partner with you. I partner with you. That if you reveal any unhealthy way in me. That if you reveal any unhealthy way in me. I will deal with it. I will deal with it. Through repentance, through repentance and forgiveness. And forgiveness. In Yeshua's mighty name. In Yeshua's mighty name. And that's what I love is that we can take scripture and we can open up the word and we can turn it into prayer. We can turn it into a declaration. Okay? That we can ask freely and he gives. He's the God who gives. 
So discernment is about examining and paying attention to what your thoughts are, asking ourselves what we believe is very powerful. Because when we know what we believe, then we know what, what we can pray about. Um, and it helps us to understand if our belief system lines up to God's belief system. So it isn't about what your friends say, what the government says, it doesn't matter what the rulers say, it doesn't matter about laws and policy and what they say, it matters what God says and His ways. And it doesn't, and he didn't ask us if we, uh, he didn't really, doesn't really want our opinion on whether or not we like him. <laughs> it's really not about what we agree with or don't agree with. Right. He's not wanting our opinion about it. He's telling us this is the way. And we get to choose the way or not. Okay. But that what I love is that we can choose, and, and we can choose to change our belief system. So what I love is that we've all been raised, we've all had parents, but we've all been raised differently. We, some of us come from different cultures, but that God, God's culture is the same. His ways are the same no matter where you live or what type of family that you've been raised in. And they never change. Um, and that we can do that through our free choice. And I love that God has given us a free choice to be able to do that. So we want to ask, is there any unbelief? So if, uh, today I ask questions and I have conversations with God that are very different than what they were like a long time ago. I will talk to him about at what level is unforgiveness a sin. I talked about that. At what level is living in fear a sin? Because I learned here that fear is a sin. And I learned here that grumbling and complaining is a sin. And at what level is living my life without considering my God or others a sin? And so if we have any type of um, pain or bitterness towards ourselves or others, or jealousy and envy, or, or think things are not fair, or rejection or fear, or anything that comes in between, there's, there's something going on in our belief system. Where we don't believe that our God is good, that He is for us, He is not against us. And that is what we do, is we ask Him, because He will reveal it to us. So there, um, I learned when I came here that unbelief can actually stop the hand of God. And I had no idea that my, that I had a part in God moving in my life. Mm -hmm. And that, that that's what a, a partnership with him was about. And so in Mark 9 and in Mark 6, there's two different times where uh, in the first one, Jesus marveled at their unbelief. So there was nothing he could do. There was no miracles that he could perform. And in Mark 9, a father talks to uh, Jesus because his son needs to be, he wants his son healed, and he says, if there's anything you can do. And Jesus said, if. What do you mean, if? Because everything is possible through me. And that man said, you are right. Strengthen my unbelief. Okay? So the Father's words change from if, you can do it to help my unbelief, I trust. So we can change that in our choices anytime, right? So these are um, some of the words that maybe would, that have described my own unbelief in my life. I'm not sure if God is doing something good in the situation. I see the situation, I'm just not sure if God's doing something good. Um, or they're always going to be like that, right? I hold people to their, um, um, their past or things that they've said. Um, there were times when I believed that God healed, but it was, and that He that He wanted to heal families, but not my family. Okay. So if you're noticing within you any fear or anger, or division, alienation or punishment, condemnation or guilt, I just want to tell you that God has showed me, and I want to tell you that He knows every inch of you, and He sees your unbelief. He sees your anger and your self-condemnation. And he's waiting for you to come to him. 
because he can't help you until you do. And he can handle your anger, and he can handle your disappointment, and he can handle what your, your fear. And that trying to hide it from him doesn't heal it. Doesn't heal it. Okay. So I would love to practice. I'm going to practice in this model. What? Just um, God's power. So let's just think of a way that where you um, don't believe or where you have said yes to unbelief in your life. Okay? And I'm going to lead you through a repentance prayer. Okay? All right. So repeat after me, and I'm, before I do that, I'm going to talk to you and tell you that we, that in the prayer ministry, that speaking out loud, when we speak out loud, it sets spiritual matters in place. And it also tells our... Uh, brain what to do and our brain will tell our body what to do. And so there's power in the spoken word. God spoke the world into existence. So Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I come to you with my free will. I come to you with my free will. I ask that you would forgive me. I ask that you would forgive me. For not believing. For not believing. Go ahead and put that in whatever it is. Father, I know that unbelief is not from you. Father, I know that unbelief is not from you. And I repent. And I repent. And I receive your forgiveness. I receive your forgiveness. And because you have forgiven me, I forgive myself. And because you have forgiven me, I forgive myself. And I release myself. And I release myself. From the spirit of unbelief, and all the dead works, and all the dead works, because of my unbelief. I ask that you would replace in me the mind of Christ, and strengthen my belief. Heal my broken heart, and show me your truth to set me free. Would anybody like to share what God's saying to you? It's on your heart? It wasn't what he said, but since my husband has been gone, butterflies have been more pronounced around me. And before we said the prayer, we went to Dubai. Oh. Yay. Yay. God shows up. Mm -hmm. He does, and it's been interesting, not only with me, but other people that I didn't know that now I do as a result of my husband dying, mm -hmm. which it's a, now is a very tight community. Oh. And they welcomed me in. People I didn't know. You know, I'm stay from his other life, but I okay. life before me. So um, being brought into a new family, a new, family. Yeah, a new community, that's yeah. awesome. That's who our God is. He is a loving God. Anybody else want to share? I love that Chrissy talked about um, the, uh, the way that she heard God talking to her was through seeing something. We can see God speaks to us in visions. He speaks to us through nature. He speaks to us. He'll, he, my time, a lot of time, I just felt peace. I felt God's over-empowering peace. A word, a verse. Janice, what were you going to share? Um, I remember when, um, I, it was probably while we were all, the teachers were in here waiting for class to start at Freedom Night, but we decided that we would, that we started to notice that we were saying, I can't believe it. We would say that just as a as a, as a statement. And I think I we were in that conversation <laughs> and we decided that was a ridiculous thing to say, I can't believe it. Mm -hmm. And so we've changed our, our uh, vocabulary. We don't say that anymore because that's <laughs> what we believe. Yeah. <laughs> but, but by speaking those words, we think they're just 
oh, cute little sayings, but they're not. Right. Every word we speak has spiritual significance. It has such spiritual significance. Yeah. And there's power in our words. So much power in our words. And that's what that discernment is, is driving down the road, coming to a stop sign, and stopping, and thinking and analyzing what are, what's in my thoughts and what am I speaking. And am I going to go forward, or am I going to stop? Am I going to change? Am I going to get into a different uh, lane? <laughs> am I going to get into a different lane? So God's answer, he, I love his, his answers are in his word, that he helps us uh, with unbelief, what we can do. And it's submitting ourselves to him and resisting the enemy. He will flee from us to come close to him, because he wants to come close to us, that he wants us to cleanse our hands, you sinners. I used to get so offended when I would read that kind of scripture, and now I don't anymore, because, um, and God wants you to ask questions while you're reading. Wow, why is that offending me? Well, that's probably because I sin, and um, I don't like to be called a sinner. <laughs> And to purify your heart, you double-minded. Okay? That one minute I have fear, but then I say I have faith. One minute I have fear, but then I say I trust. Okay? That's being double. I love that Kathy talks about that, that double-minded. Something very easy. Right? I say I, I trust that everything's going to be good, and then I hurry and I run on the phone, and I talk about all the ways that I don't trust the situation. <laughs> That's a double-minded. Um... And so he wants us to cleanse our hands. Well, do you know that sometimes your hands get stinky? <laughs> yeah. And if you're around a lot of children like I used to be, like I'd say, go wash your hands. Go wash your hands before you eat. You need to make sure that your hands are clean, right? That, in fact, that is the number one thing that my doctors told me was to keep my hands clean. But that's what would keep away. Um, that, that, that would be the way that would keep me the healthiest when I was sick. Today. today, to clean your hands. And we all need to wash our hands. And we also need to be able to let someone say, you need to go wash your hands. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to have people in our life, and we need to be able to um, receive correction, to receive challenging when somebody says to you, you need to go wash your hands. And you ask God, do I need to wash my hands? That's what I say. Go ask Him through the discernment. God, do I need to wash my hands? My friend is telling me that I do. And hands refers to what our, our work. It's our work. Yeah. 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 Good. It's good. Yeah, that, that's, that is oh, the obedience of, of, of um, living and um, using. Uh, using our hands to that example, that metaphor, that, um, that we are his workers. Okay. And it's a question that you have to ask yourself, is who is God to you? And I love it because there are, um, all, there's only one God. And you have to be the one to make that decision. And we all make that decision. We all choose who do we believe you are. And even though there are, in India there's over three million gods, our Elohim is the only one who conquered the enemy and who gives supernatural power freely to us. He doesn't take any bribes. He doesn't change his mind. He's awake all the time and he gives us eternity. <laughs> right? And when we resist the devil, that is not a, that's not a passive type of situation. It is to take action. It is through obedience. It is standing and fighting. Combating, enduring, being resistant. Okay, because the enemy will run and he will flee. Okay? It says in Romans 12, not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of, my, of our mind, that by testing we may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And because we've all been raised in different situations, we may all, parents may have taught us different things. Our parents or the people around us or our educators may have taught us truths and may have taught us untruths. 
and that, that we go to God's word to line up what is the truth. Okay? Because that is his answer for us, is that we are to submit to him, we are to resist the enemy, and we are to ask him to help us. And so there is a spiritual war, there's a spiritual realm, and he wants us to be aware of it, and that we don't always see it, right, uh, around us, but that there is a complete uh, world, spiritual world around us. That lest Satan should take get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his, desi- of his devices. Um, that means that the enemy wants us to be ignorant. He wants us to be weak and unaware that there's anything that we need to be worried about. Right? But God wants us to pay attention. He has a normal and he wants us to, he want, God wants us to follow him. Um, we talked earlier about who blinds our eyes and the reason that our eyes that our eyes can be blinded, how that blinding happens. In Proverbs 4.23 is the answer to that, another answer to that, or a different way of thinking about it. It's in our thinking and our attitudes and our beliefs. In Proverbs 4.23 it says, Be careful how you think. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Another way that that that's the, another way that the scripture says it is guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And what I, I take that to the next step, which is so worried to me, is that what I do now for being careful how I think does directly affect whatever eternity or my future is. What mm-hmm. I do now has an impact on what happens when I die. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not just a fairy tale or a Christian idea. Right. That we are living eternity right here on earth right now. Mm -hmm. And what we do does matter for eternity. What we are accomplishing here on earth for our God. And that what we do affects the kingdom. And you know what that means? It means it affects the people around you. That what you do affects the people around you what kind of things you're choosing to think about and what kind of things you're choosing to do. Um, there is scientific data. We, we love to read about Caroline Leaf. She's a scientist who studies the brain. And she talks about the thought processes and how we can change, that, how powerful our brain is and that our brain never, um, that our brain um, doesn't ever get old. It's always growing. It's always changing and that it's, um, flexible. So it, it, it can change. It has elasticity. And we are the ones who can change it. I remember reading about a study about somebody who wanted to be a cab driver in London and they had to study every street in London. And they took a brain scan of this person before they did the studying and took the test and after. And that, that person actually grew their brain. See, we can grow our brain. We can grow our brain. And our brain is very powerful. And we can... We can change those pathways. We can, they're called neural pathways, and we can change those pathways by what we're choosing to think about. God told me, you need to pay attention, Cindy, and so I decided to take two apps off of my phone because he said, what are you paying attention to? What are you listening to? What are you reading? And what are you talking about? But my two were about what was I listening and what was I watching? And so I took the apps off my phone. I have freedom. Right? Because God is telling me, pay attention. Pay attention to what you're doing. Because it does have an effect um, on people around us. So, And our choices do do what Robert says, that we bring the natural effect of reaping and sowing in the kingdom of God. And that is for eternity. And in Proverbs 18, it's 18.31 that our tongue has the power of life and death. So we want to be thinking about our thinking. Caroline Leaf um, is the brain scientist that we follow. It says in Isaiah 26.3 that that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. And finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are, are good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. 
And one of the apps that, the, that God told me to, to delete was the Neighborhood app. It's about where, you know, the neighbors get on and they talk about, like, I saw a bear on this street or I saw a bear on that street. But there were things that were going on on the Neighborhood app that was not um, just, was not lovely, did not have good report, was not helpful. And I took it off. And because... Um, because God wants us to protect and guard our heart, what we're thinking about. Okay? And then we do that through the sermon, Toby. You know, I just looked up the, um, the meaning of the word whatsoever. And it says it's a one or some or every or all without specification. <laughs> and that's kind of like what you said. Uh, because when you're on your apps, you're, you're paying attention to stuff that has nothing to do with you. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Whatsoever. Right. That's a good word. That's a good word. Yeah. That's good. So we can change our thinking by what we're watching. Through detox, we can detox our thoughts. We can get rid of these. We can we can ask God to help us detox our thoughts, renewing our mind and building new neural pathways. He's given us that power with Holy Spirit. We, it's not something that we can do on our own. Okay? To know what you're thinking about, listen to what comes out of your mouth. That will tell you what you're thinking about. What we choose to think about changes our choices. And what we think about is what we talk about. Our words tell our brains what to do and our brain puts into action our responses. So I hope that you know by now that your God want you to know that your thoughts are important to him. Your thoughts are important. Okay? There are 28 verses on the power of your thoughts and 19 verses, 19 verses about controlling your thoughts. That we, it is our work to do that. He's given us the tools, but we need to be growing our discerner and tuning our discerner as we go. I'm just going to tell you that there was a situation, I love this because it was so real in my life. And even though it happened a while ago, it just made a huge imprint in me. I got into the swimming pool, and I uh, w w went swimming. And my mind started racing, because when you're swimming, you're not, your mind is, you're with your mind. You're alone with your mind in the water. And so my mind started racing. And I didn't want that. So I started taking my thoughts captive. And I started, I couldn't do that in my mind because it wasn't working. I kept trying to do it without speaking. So I just started talking out loud in the water. <laughs> and I just kept swimming. And I just started speaking out loud underneath the water. I got out of the pool, felt, real, felt like, okay, there's been a shift. I feel a change. I'm not, I'm not dwelling on that. I'm not thinking about that anymore. My mind's on God. I go into the sauna and I have this amazing encounter with somebody who wants to know about, that has never been to church, and wants to know what would be the one thing I would tell them to do if they were looking for a church. If I would have been thinking about my situation, God would not have been able to use me to speak to this woman. Because he wants to use all of us, but we have to have, be a vessel of honor. We have to be filled up with him and not with junk. Junk in the trunk. And so um, I was, I, what, a, what an honor it was. And what a powerful, sober um, reflection of what of the opportunity I would have missed for His kingdom. And so that's what He wants. He wants us to be ready. He wants us to be thinking about our thinking. He wants us to be discerning as we go. What did you tell her? I told her that the main to me what I told her. Okay, so this is what I told her. I told her that whatever church she chose to go. That the only, the one thing that she needed to, to do was to know that it was God's son and going after the heart of his son would lead her, lead her to salvation. That's what I felt, that's what I felt God wanted me to tell her, that it's, it was knowing who his son was and what his son had done. And that if there was a church that didn't teach that Jesus, Yeshua, was the way, I said I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there. That's what I said. I know it's like the one thing, right? Well, I love this in John 10. 
because the sheep, we are his sheep, and we follow him because they recognize his voice. See, we have over 30,000 thoughts in our mind a day. We debate with ourselves in our own mind. We talk to ourselves. We need to be able to, to discern and separate and be still and know whose voice is it so that we recognize it. Um, and that we never, because when we know his voice, we won't follow a stranger's voice. We won't follow a stranger's voice. So there's all kinds of really good things that happen. So this is what Christy was talking about, spiritually, physically, and mentally, that there is a, there is a uh, adversary, and these are the three ways he wants to come after us. Well, these are the, and absolutely the way that God heals us is through these. It's going to be in these um, three areas. And I'm going to go back to that one. There we go. Okay. All right. Did you know that the adversary has wicked, murder, murderous thoughts about you? Yes. He does. Yeah. And he wants you to deny the power of God with no testimony. And I got to talk to my friend today that the, that we are saved by the um, power by by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and that they sit right next to each other. That the word of our testimony has so much power. It has so much power. Satan's place for you spiritually is called hell. There's people today that don't even believe that there's a hell. Okay, but I'm going to tell you that there is a hell. And if you cannot get us to reject God's Son, Jesus Yeshua, then He will do everything He can do to make your faith, life, powerless. He will come after you um, physically and then blame God and, to, and then tell you that God is the one who did it. He wants you to walk around talking about all your bodily problems and reliving them over and over again because your words tell your brain what to do and your brain tells your body what to do. When I went through the chemo, I would, I would not engage in any kind of conversation that did not have to do with healing for my body, that did not have to do with what God said about who I was. When my doctors would talk to me and they would tell me my, the, my statistics, I would say I'm not a statistic. And I always, in that God was a part of my um, journey. He mentally wants to blind our hearts and our minds and attacks us with unholy thoughts, such as fear. An unholy thought is fear or worry or anger. Um, and he wants you to curse your brain with unholy thoughts. The American Medical Association has documented that 98% of medical problems are rooted in fear or stress. So it's a good thing to ask your God, um, talk to me about what this looks like in my own life. Yeah, so uh, maybe maybe three weeks ago now, uh, I had this dream, and um, in G December and January I had two surgeries in my bladder for a bladder tumor. Okay. It was a really large one. And in fact, I had to go to the hospital because I couldn't urinate because my bladder was so clogged up with blood clots. I had to go to the ER, and they performed emergency surgery right there, and then they, a second one after they cleaned up a little bit so they could you know, finish it off. And anyway, so I've been having some problems again. And about three weeks ago, I had this dream in which this person who I know, who's like really, really practical, he's like the most practical person in my life. In fact, he's so practical, I find him annoying sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, in this dream, I saw him on, I was watching him on television, and he was doing this commercial. And in this commercial, he was saying, everybody who goes to the hospital to deal with this issue has a 100% recovery rate. Mm. And then I woke up. And I thought, I knew that guy was saying I need to go back to the hospital to get this looked at again, but that I will have 100% recovery. Mm -hmm. And it was coming from this really practical person who's like, you know, you need to go to the hospital and have that looked at. <laughs> and not more faith oriented, like, oh, I'm just gonna believe in God for healing, you know? So anyways, I thought that was God, or an angel giving me this okay. vision, or a dream that I'm like, I need to go back to the hospital. but. There will be a 100% recovery rate. Good. Good. Speak that out loud. Speak that out loud. I love that. Speak that out loud. Yeah, that's good. That's good. 
That's good. All right. Well, the, God's answers to the enemy attacks is for the weapons of our war, our warfare are not carnal, um, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So a mental stronghold is a statement that we count as true, um, but is really false. Like, oh, this is just the way I am. I've always been like this. Um, or this is just how I was raised. Okay. Or I can't forgive because you have no idea what they did to me. Right? So that's that pulling down. That's what a stronghold is. It's a false truth. Because God um, can break apart um, who you are and he can give you a new identity and he can help you to forgive so you can release that person so that you don't walk around with bitterness and stress and anger in your chemical makeup in your body. Okay, that's who your God is. He wants, he has given us the power to do that and we can pull down the strongholds that have happened in our life of the traumas that have happened in our life, of any type of corruption that has happened. In 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, casting down imaginations, asking God questions, lots of questions, um, any kind of philosophy. He wants us to um, bring them down. And, it, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity. Every thought, not some thoughts, but every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's what he wants. So anyway, so I was uh, walking around this week and this was my uh, casting down my, my imagination was that I was just saying, you know, I'm just not a part of a family, right? That's sometimes how, you know, that was my feeling. I'm not part of a family. Well, that next morning um, I was reading and I found out that there was a hundred verses that I am a part of the family. Mm -hmm. I'm a part of the family of God. Right. And he is my father. And he is my he father. Wants to be your father. Right. He's my heavenly father. Yes, I had an earthly father and I had an earthly mom. But he's my heavenly father and I'm always a part of his family. Right? And that I'm not alone. Right? So that's cast that's bringing down those strongholds and those imaginations and those Speculations that are going on in our mind, right? And against his truth, because his truth is is that I am a part of his family. So he wants he wants he's strengthening he's strengthening my discernment. He's strengthening my discernment, right? He allows me to space to stop and decide where I'm going to choose to participate in a conversation in my thought life and say no to it or say yes to it, right? Or, in, or a conversation I'm having with somebody. Is my response judgment or is it compassion? Is it rejection or is it acceptance? And if I fall down, I say hallelujah because here I've learned that when I fall down and I'm operating outside the kingdom of God, I can say, God, forgive me. I was not operating inside of your kingdom. I'm judging. Judgment is not from you. Forgive me. I love how we teach it for the children. We have a big, long rug, big yellow rug that's for the kingdom. And then we have outside is things that are not of the kingdom. And when God says, I want to, I want to be king of your heart, and we say yes, he says, come into the kingdom. And we come into the kingdom. But as we, live, we go through the day, sometimes we're, his kingdom, there's, all, there's only joy, peace, and righteousness in his kingdom. And everything else is on the outside. And sometimes we step out of the kingdom. But God says, come back in the kingdom. Come back in the kingdom. And I can do that through saying, God, I'm judging. Judgment is not from you. God, um, I'm angry. Anger is not from you. God, I'm getting really offended. Or I don't like the way that this person is acting. God, that's not from you. They get to choose. I get to choose to to walk in your pathway of, of joy, peace, and righteousness. And so that's um, his answer to the enemy's attacks. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience um, is fulfilled. So that's, that's us building our lives of obedience into maturity. 
right, and clearing the ground of every obstruction. I heard this really cool story about this kid who got beat up a lot at school, and he was a believer, and he prayed and prayed for these kids in high school that were beating him up. And because, you know, you pray, God, I'm so mad they hurt me. I want, you know, I want you to take revenge on them. But this kid was praying for, this kid was praying for these kids that were beating him up. And I, and do you know how God revenged them? That one of the kids that were, that was beating him up ended up being his best man at his wedding. That's God's revenge. That's God's revenge. Right? So forgiveness and repentance cancel the enemy's legal rights. And we do this through forgiving ourselves and talking to our God when we mess up. And I love all three of these. If we forgive men or, and women, that means men, women, children. I've done forgiveness prayers with my grandchildren when they've hurt my feelings. And I've said yes to receiving that. Um, then my God will forgive me. If I forgive, if I don't forgive, then my Father will not forgive me. And if we confess our sins, He's faith, faithful and just to forgive us. And I just want to say that that forgiveness, we can choose to forgive or not to forgive, but um, we get to live out those choices. And I didn't know when I was single and I was super angry with my ex-husband that... Um, when I wouldn't forgive him, what that damage did to my relationship with my children and how it affected my children because I wouldn't forgive my ex husband. Mm -hmm. How it affected my relationships with the other members of my family because I was holding on to anger. And so I was trying to compartmentalize my God that I am going to forgive these ways, but I'm not going to forgive these ways. And he, God said, well, you can choose. I would really like it if you would forgive because it releases you from pain. And then I can bless you. But I chose not to do that. So I got to live in that for a long time. And I learned about that and I'd say, hallelujah, thank you, God. <laughs> Robert. Yeah, the word up there, legal, is something that uh, demands thinking. Legal means that you, there are certain things that you do, and if you don't do them, there are consequences. Uh -huh. uh, that idea was never presented to me in, in whatever Christianity was. Uh, and now, now it is a different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Legal. Mm -hmm. uh, spirits follow the rules. They do. And Yahweh does too. Yes. There's a the spiritual world. Yes, it's true. Can I ask a kind of an obscure question? Sure. We're talking about spirits and all of that. Mediums and people who claim to be able to, to speak to people on the other side. Mm -hmm. What, if anything, is that, is it real? Um, is it a farce? Is it considered a sin if you ask somebody for a reading? Just... Well, I will tell you, Christy, it's in the Word. It talks about it in the Word. Mm -hmm. And it says not, there was a king that went to a medium, and um, he, what, Janice, what did he end up happening to him? He, <laughs> he, he ended up being dethroned. Yeah. He was dethroned, and um, he there, lost his mind. he lost his mind. And so it says in the Word not to, um, not to in any way dabble in any of that or not to engage in any of that. And is it real? It is absolutely real. It is absolutely real. I mean, you know, real. you hear about you know, psychics. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, right. Or whatever, right. And you know that right. we see the image of the crystal ball on this lady. Yeah. No, it's real. My, da my dad was involved with um, the, the, um, the occult. In the occult with. Um, oh, um. The eight ball or the, um, not the eight ball or the, the seances Ouija board. or the Ouija board. Oh, okay. He was involved with the Ouija board. Right. And um, I was at his house one day and he made me go in the back room because, and then all of a sudden uh, there was some stuff going on. I could hear all this noise and the Ouija board was moving, flying around the room. And that actually led him to God, was through that spiritual oppression. 
But yes, is there a spiritual world? Absolutely. Well, and just like yeah. saying, if yes. there's another side, yes. so to speak, or you know, we're on this side and spirits are on the other side, however you want to term it. But you know, if we want to speak to our spirit, our deceased husbands, wives, mm -hmm. grandparents, whatever. And, mm -hmm. Says, well, it says in the Word not to do that. Right, it says in the Word that you can do that, but God does not want us speaking into that world right. and do it. Kathy? The Word says that you will get an unenlightened answer. Okay. Well, as I were talking about a, discernment, so what do you discern from? And that's why I'm just, I had talked to Esther about it as well. Yeah. Like, okay, so I want to I know, I want to know what happened. Right. Or I want to know what people are doing on the other side, whatever you want to call it. I don't have the right words right now, but right. What happens when I die? Is, you know, is there heaven or hell? Is there purgatory? Whatever. Like my first husband didn't die naturally. Is that a different set of circumstances when you go to the other side than the husband who did die of natural causes? You know what I'm saying? Like in God's just thinking of all of these things as we're going through or sharpening your skills and right, opening right. your heart, is there right. a difference? And you said there is a hell. So if somebody takes their life, did they automatically go to hell, even though they were a good person? Versus somebody who um, dies naturally, maybe not a good person, but did they go to you know I'm sorry, this is a whole other I know, I'm that's, sure, that's conversation, okay. but just you're talking about spirits and right. they're around. They're totally around. Right. Yeah. Oh, so sorry. Probably. Oh, that's okay. Just, and I've heard this phrase. I've learned it here. It makes sense to me. Just because you can mm -hmm. does not mean that you should. Okay. That is beneficial. Mm -hmm. Does not mean that it's beneficial. Janice, you want to say something? Yeah. Um, I would add to that that um, why do you want to know? Well, and I had this conversation with Kathy okay. last week about okay. I wanted I wanted to the guy the reason is we always need to know our motives. Correct. That's why I'm asking. It's like well, if our motive is is to do something opposite of what God is asking us to do because we want to to know, then we have to go to the scripture set that says it's not me that lives anyway, it's Christ that lives in me. So why am I wanting to well, we discussed yeah. that because I wanted to know my husband was brought into my life for a certain reason, right? And then he was gone one day, and why did that happen to me? So her and I did this crime. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Okay. So do you know there's? Do you know? Okay. You were. There's three kinds of suffering. Okay. We're born into a fallen world. Sometimes we're victims. And sometimes we do. Okay. So it sounds like there was something that occurred that has nothing to do with it, but all of them cause pain, and the answer to all of them is the same. Right. That's what I'm saying. So yeah. how did, you know, and looking at it now, over the course of the past eight years, the differences in, like I just said, one chose, the other one say didn't. How is that different in your discernment? You know what I'm saying? Like, I took it very, very hard when my husband committed suicide. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand why or how, and I really wanted to seek a medium. Why would he do this? Why, what, you know, what in your, but there's no, it's you know, I mean, just one of those things. And then when my second husband died, same thing, but in a different way. And right. I know that doesn't make sense, but it, to me it does because I live, I've lived through it. Right, and I think that those are all questions that I think that is going to be between you and right. God and what his word says. And what his word says. I would line it up to what his word says. Okay. Yeah. So. Can I just make one interjection? Sure. So uh, I had this dream one night, and my mother came to me. And in the dream it was Christmas, and we were standing outside of a mall, and she was insisting, my mother was kind of older, so she was insisting I buy her, or she buys me a Christmas present. And I kept re refusing it. I kept saying, Mother, I'm not going to let you buy me. You know, I'm an adult male. You're an elderly woman now. So, but she kept insisting I, I buy this, this fleece. So I finally consented. And I went in, I bought the fleece, and then I woke up. And I thought, oh, what a funny dream. So I'm sitting at the bus stop, 
about two hours later, and I get a call from the police department that your mother, we found her, just passed away. So she came to me in a dream after she had died, but right when she first died, and she was giving me a gift. So it really generated a sense of peace for me, and I didn't have to go back to New York and look at, you know, make peace in any more materialistic way. I just felt like she came to me in a way and was giving me this gift as she was passing on. So with that said, I would just suggest, like you said, it's between you and these persons, and I would pray to God. And maybe you have been, but I would keep praying and asking God to show me or um, give permission for me to see some of these these questions that my heart still seems to find answers for. Because I know, as I said, we're talking with Kathy, and asked me, why did you want to know? Because I did. Like, you know, it's just the natural of the tug on your sweater. You know, mommy, 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 I want to know, I want to know, or can I have that, can I have that? And my brain just was going and going and going and saying, I want to know, I want to know, I want to know. And she said, well, that's, it's not about you. That's right. pride. Right. That's pride. And I went, oh, got it. Okay. Well, listen, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to close this because it's 8.30. Uh -huh. And so, the, no, no, you're, no. And we're just going to continue this conver these conversations. And I just want to encourage all of you online and here in the room that our God answers questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, his question is going to, he's going to reveal it to you. And sometimes he's going to say, I'm not going to. That he has that choice to do that. So some things have not been answered for me. And some things have been answered for me. But that I trust my God even if I don't get the answer from him, but I trust him. So um, I just encourage you to tune your discerner and to um, this week um, go about your week and take think about your thoughts, what's what kind of what's happening with my thoughts, um, um, and have a conversation with God about them. You know, are my thoughts His thoughts, or are my thoughts other thoughts? And lining those thoughts up that are not his thoughts to his thoughts and his truths and his ways. And that's how we can get that spiritual dis discernment that we all have great questions about. So, Father God, we come before you and thank you, Father, for your truth that sets us free. And, Lord, I thank you that um, in your word, Father, you bring revelation. And, Father, I ask that you would enlighten me. Um, the eyes of all of our hearts to see you, to pursue you, to study you, to, um, to have clarity and discernment about who you are and what your kingdom is all about and where you want our attention focused. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray right now and declare that every person in this room pays attention. Mm -hmm. Pays attention to you and what you are saying to them. God, I pray that they, people here would be bold in speaking out testimony about what you're doing. And God, we thank you for discernment. God, I pray that you would, that you would hear us, that you would bless us, and that you would show us truth. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen.